What's up guys? Welcome back to another episode of Fed Up Church. I'm Sean Finney and today we're going through Ecclesiastes. Now we've gone through the first few chapters here, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this week we're looking at chapter 5. Remember this is Ecclesiastes means preacher or teacher, one who addresses an assembly, and it was written by Solomon or one of his scribes based on a sermon that he gave or something he wrote towards the end of his life. Solomon, wisest man who ever lived, right? And so far, we've been hearing this ongoing theme. Everything is meaningless, everything's meaningless, everything's vanity, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. But in the last chapter, we got to an interesting turning point when he basically came to the conclusion that everything is vain, everything is useless, unless you're sharing it with someone. So we talked about that, if you remember the three strands, right? A three braided rope is not easily broken. And we discussed what that meant last week. This week, it's going to be interesting because if you remember, Solomon's approaching this from a position of science, right? Everything you can see under the sun. He's talking most likely to a bunch of agnostics. Uh, or he's either that or he's preaching to the church today. Because as you'll see when we get into this chapter, it is so relevant. <laughs> today I'll be reading from the NIV. We have this handy dandy book that I picked up locally at the Ed McKay's bookstore. And it's the NIV Message Parallel Bible, and it's awesome. I'm loving this thing. I don't know if you guys have ever read the Message Bible, but it is hilarious. Uh, highly recommend it if you want a good laugh, because it maintains the original emotion of the language. That's to convey the message, that's the whole point. But I'm reading from the New International Version today. Now, <laughs> as we go in to the house of God, we're going to learn a little bit more about it. And that's what Solomon's talking about. That's how the first chapter is going to start off, is what you need to do when you come into God's presence. So, without further ado, let's roll. All right, so I got my handy dandy cup of coffee. Not today, Satan. And we're going to start digging into it. So go ahead and flip over to Ecclesiastes chapter 5, and we'll pick up in verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know that they do wrong. Interesting. Very first thing, we've talked about all this up to this point, that everything's meaningless unless you've got someone that you're sharing it with. You've got somebody that you can leave it to. All of it's just useless toil. And we focus so much on trying to find out like what's the purpose and what's the meaning of life and what Solomon is saying at this point, having done everything he's done, having lived the life he's lived and everything he's accomplished. I mean, you gotta remember he's king and he's also preaching. He, the wisest man who ever lived is giving you a little bit of a clue, a little bit of an insight into what he's learned as worth investing your energy and your time on at least up to this point he said nothing is right except for you to just live your life eat drink and find satisfaction in your work that's if that's all there is is what's under the sun then that's the best that we can hope for but here he's saying now turning it turning their attention towards god because you remember they didn't disagree they didn't, nobody was arguing whether God existed. That wasn't even the discussion, right? They're agnostic. So like the majority of church members today, <laughs> they believe in God, but yeah, whatever. I'm not going to get too big into it. So it says here, guard your steps. Solomon says, guard your steps. When you go to the house of God, guard your steps. Why? Why? Like up to this point, he has looked for answers in like the marketplace he's looked for answers in jobs in work in the field he's looked for answers to like the purpose and meaning of life in meaningless relationships many of them as he was saying he's like whatever my eye lusted after i let it have right to try to find everything and learn everything about everything that i could it's basically what he's saying up to the first few chapters and now he's warning us when we turn our attention towards God, and okay, going into the house, into the temple, right into the house of God, guard your steps. 
Or in other words, tread lightly. Be careful. We don't cons- we don't look at like the average church like that today, right? Like nobody thinks that. Like, oh, I'm going to church. It's you know it's Sunday. It's the the Lord's day. <laughs> Even though the Sabbath is Saturday, um, we're it's Sunday, so we got to go to church. But nobody considers like, hey, be careful. You're going to a dangerous place. And this is what Solomon is alluding to here. The danger that awaits when you step into God's presence. Now, God's everywhere, but Jesus said, wherever two two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst with them, right? There's something to bringing a group of people together to worship God. And Solomon's saying, be careful. So when he says, guard your steps, when you come to the house of God, he says specifically why. He's warning us to go to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools. The sacrifice of fools. Now that's something we're going to talk about quite a bit here as we go through this chapter. But guard your steps, right? Guard your steps and as you go to the house of God and go near to listen, go near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools. Now he says, do not be quick with your mouth right there. There's your answer. If you were wondering what's the sacrifice of fools, it's a lot of words being quick with your mouth. And that's what he's saying. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God, anything, (laughs) Even worship and praise. He's saying anything. Doesn't matter. Anything. Don't do it lightly. God is in heaven and you are on the earth. So let your words be few. This is important. Let your words be few. God's in heaven. You're on the earth. Like know your place. And that's basically what he's saying is like understand who you're going to worship. So don't take it lightly. This is a direct reflection of the church today. If you look at, go into any church, you'll see people doing whatever they're doing. They're on their phone. If sometimes they're half listening, sometimes they're half not. Sometimes the sermons that are given, and because it's not isolated to the people in the pews. And this is the biggest mistake I think we make as a Christian church is that we think that, oh, we, it's the people in the pews that are not listening, that are not paying attention and are not learning anything. And that's not always the case. A lot of times, it's the guy behind the pulpit who has not been listening to God, who's not been paying attention to what God's been saying, and he hasn't learned anything new. So it's not just the guy in the pew. It's the guy behind the pulpit, too. The entire church, from top down, needs a new reverence, a new healthy fear and respect for who God is. And this is not a new problem. This is the same kind of problem that Solomon saw in his day. So that's why he's saying, guard your steps when you go to the house of God and don't offer the sacrifice of fools. I find it interesting. Now, I want to point this out here. He, he, he called it the sacrifice of fools. Now, if you know any idiot out there, it's not really that much of a sacrifice for them to run their mouth. That happens all the time, naturally. That's what fools do. So why is he calling it a sacrifice? Now, they're going to the temple. They're going into the house of God, and he's offering a sacrifice of fools, right? This hypothetical fool that he's talking about, saying, don't be like him. Don't go and offer this sacrifice. You got to remember, that's what the temple was for. They would go into the temple to offer sacrifices, and the word that he's referring to here is sacrifice. There's many different kinds of sacrifice in the Old Testament. This is, there was one that you would do as a whole burnt offering, Right. And then there was one that would be like a partially like a offering, a burnt offering, uh, wouldn't be entirely consumed by, you know, the sacrifice portion of it. And then the other half would then be used and eaten. It would be consumed. He's choosing to use specifically the word that's talking about the sacrifice that is offered. Like part of it is offered to God and the rest of it is everyone comes together and they, you know, eat of that. And the problem with that is it becomes very easy for that kind of sacrifice to then translate into, you know, more of like a festivity and, you know, a whole bunch of Baptists getting together eating. That, that's kind of what it reminded me of when I was reading through this. 
But what he's saying here is don't offer that sacrifice. Tread lightly when you go before God and don't offer the sacrifice of fools. They speak, right? A fool is known for their many words. So he says, don't offer that sacrifice. The sacrifice that then will then translate into a distraction that pulls people away from worshiping an almighty God of the universe and instead turns into a barbecue at the backyard of the church. Don't be quick with your mouth. And if anything, he's saying, don't be hasty even in your heart to utter anything before God. Like, don't rush it. No matter what you've got going on, God requires your attention in your time. And it's dangerous when we don't give him that reverence or that respect. Um, you think about it. Would you walk into, you know, your boss's office? He, he, he you know, schedules a meeting with you and he's pulling you in. And you guys are going to have a discussion and you sit down and you pull out your phone and you're just kind of flipping on, on your phone, not p really paying attention to what he's saying. How do you think he's going to react? And that guy's human, right? He's on the earth with you. That's what Solomon is saying. Don't do that before the God of the universe. This is not something we can take lightly. Go to hear, right? Go to listen. And I always told my kids, you got two ears, one mouth, means you should listen twice as much as you speak. And we make this mistake, you know, as pastors and preachers, we make the mistake of thinking that every situation we go into, anytime there's a gathering of people, that we have to offer some words of wisdom, or we have to be able to offer counsel, or we have to be able to offer some kind of, you got your money's worth for coming and to this group today. And we neglect, so bad we neglect, the ministry of presence. Sometimes... When people come before you with their problems, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to even, I don't know what to say to them. I don't know how to comfort them because I, I don't know how I could be comforted if I was going through what they're going through right now. A lot of times people don't want you to fix it. A lot of times it's not things you can even do to fix a situation. Don't neglect the ministry of your presence and just being wholly present, like completely present in the moment. That speaks volumes. Sometimes the best sermons I have ever heard were silent. And we, we neglect that as a church. As the, American, as the American Christian church as a whole, I think that's something that we leave out. Is we feel the need to fill every gap in time, every minute has to be scheduled in every service that you go to. They know that, the, you know, we're going to sing a song for three minutes and 37 seconds from this point to this point, And then immediately from that point, we're going to start the announcements. And then from that point, we're going to start another song, do the offering. And then from that point, you're going to, you know, do another song or have a special song sung by somebody. And then from that point, we're going to have the preacher come up and then he's got to fill the next 45 minutes. And then to the minute, he better stop at whatever noon or whenever it is, because then we got to leave. Every minute is scheduled. And when every minute is scheduled and then every silent moment has to be filled nobody's listening now sure they might be listening to the guy behind the pulpit and he might be giving a great sermon or he might be giving your average church sermon that you would see in churches today which is very little bible it tends to be let's read one verse or one word of one verse and i'm going to just spout my opinions for 45 minutes about that one word or that one, one verse and how I think it relates to the current political climate. You are on the earth. God is in heaven. God is not really concerned with your political opinions. You are, and that's great. You have every right to have those. But guard your steps, preachers. Guard your steps, Christians. When you come to the house of God, make sure that you're also giving space to listen because we forget that Christianity is a two-way street. We're not worshiping the pagan idols that they can't speak, right? And if you read through any of the minor prophets, God repeats this time and time and time again, is that I am not like these pagan idols who have no breath in them, who cannot speak, who do not eat, who cannot help you. 
if that's the case, then maybe the best thing we can do sometimes is to shut up and listen. Listen more than we speak. And when we speak, we shouldn't take it lightly. Don't be hasty. Don't rush into uttering anything before God. That's what Solomon's trying to teach us here today as we read through this chapter. Now, I find it interesting also that he says to guard your steps when you come before the house of God, right? Because if you remember, in Exodus, what did God tell Moses when he was coming to the mountain? Because if you remember, he was going to the mountain to meet God, right? When he's going to the mountain to, to meet God, everyone was warning him not to go. It's dangerous. It's wrapped in smoke. God came down in a fire and consumed the whole thing. Animals were required to be stoned to death if they even tried to approach the mountain. He told him, if you go to Exodus, it's Exodus 3, 5. It says, God said, do not come any closer, right? Exodus 3, 5, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Watch your step. Take off your sandals because you're standing on holy ground. Now, this is interesting, too, because why? Did you ever wonder, like, why God told him to take off the sandals? Because you're on holy ground? Like, there's a lot of reasons behind that culturally as well. But I found it interesting that God told Moses to take off his sandals. Everyone told him, don't, don't even go. Don't, right, don't go there. It's dangerous. It's a dangerous place. And then God says, take off your sandals, but come on in. Like, come into this discussion, this meeting with me. Come on in. Now, you are going before God, right? The God of the universe. And he has one request. Kick the Crocs to the curb, man. Like, let's go. Come on in, but take the shoes off. What Solomon says is to guard your steps. Don't offer the sacrifice of fools. But this connotation that it carries to tread lightly, to watch how you enter. And then looking back at what God said with, take your sandals off before you come into my presence, these things that you have. Now, these things that you have covering your feet. Because your steps matter. And that's what God is, was saying there too. Your steps matter. You can't just walk in casually like you're going to the grocery store. You can't just like stroll in here and bring these fake coverings that you put over your feet to protect your steps but not guard your steps. There's a difference between trying to protect your your feet, right, to protect your steps, versus to trying to guard your steps, to watch how you walk. And God is saying, come in to this, come, come into my presence, but I need you to be honest, I need you to be sincere, and I need you to remove the mask you put on your feet to protect them. In the same way, Solomon is saying the same thing. Guard your steps, but don't take it lightly. Don't go in just saying whatever you want to say like it's a conversation dropping in with a friend. You're going before an almighty God, and he requires one thing of you. Take this fake thing that you've masked your steps with. Whatever that mask is for you, take that off when you come into my presence. And there's so many times I feel like, as a church, not only do we not do that as Christians, and we do, because to feel vulnerable, to take off whatever mask it is that you wear every day, and to protect yourself, right? A lot of these trauma responses, you know, we have the, everyone has a mask that they wear, whether it's you're wearing it at work, whether you're wearing it to school, whether you're wearing it around, you know, family that you don't really like to hang out with, or, you know, actually your own family and you're trying to put on this mask of 
you know, I am a strong father, a strong provider, a strong mother. I can take care of everything because I'm mom or I'm dad. But it's a mask, right? Because on the inside, each and every one of us know we're we're struggling with feelings of inadequacy, feelings of failure, feelings of I'm not good enough and I'm not I'm not able to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And there's not enough time in the day and I feel like I'm letting everyone down. The mask is what God is saying, leave that at the door. Take the mask off. The idea that you walk it, the language in churches, I can't. This is, I talk about the, the biggest Thing I think kills Christianity is churches. And uh, here the reason, hear me out, okay? The reason I feel that way, we encourage people to wear a mask in church. Where else do people talk like that? How you doing, brother? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. You know, the first, not the last, head, not tail. You don't talk like that at work. And how you do talk, it works probably different. Why bring a different version of you before God? Why bring a different fake version of you masked before God? As if he can't see through it. But there's a problem with that. God can see through it. That's, it's not like you're hiding anything from God. The problem is you're hiding everything from everyone else who is going there. And they look at you and think, you've got it all together. Because you paint a pretty mask. You can hide your issues and your scars just peachy. And that's not helpful to anyone else, right? Because then nobody's willing to be vulnerable. Nobody's willing to admit, I struggle with X, Y, and Z. Or I have this issue. Or I don't know how to... When Paul said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as a manner of some is, even the more so as you see the day approaching, right? That famous line that gets quoted by every Baptist preacher out there to try to make you come to church. That's not what it meant, but <clears throat> God, it, 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 it angers me every time I hear that misappropriated to try to make people go to church. It's not what it meant. What it meant was not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, right? As family, friends and family, as a community of support, bringing each other together to help each other, to bind each other up, right? To bind up the broken, lift up the brokenhearted and set captives free. We can't set captives free if we refuse to acknowledge the cage we're bound by. So the fake mask has to come off. Who you pretend to be in church because it's church and you can't act like that at church, you have to bring your whole self to church. Bring your entire self to church. Church is supposed to be a hospital for the sick, right? Not a museum for saints. That's not what a church is. If that's what your church is, and it's just heavily painted and over and just fake, that's not that's not what church is meant to be. And I'm sorry, that's not what it's meant to be. I I struggle with going to churches where the majority that comes out of the pulpit is what I've basically summed up here, right? What Solomon was alluding to, and this is why we have to take the sandals off. We have to remove the mask and get real with one another. Get more than just superficial. The fact that you look at a Bible and go 52 times a year if you are going on Sunday, sometimes, what, 104 if you go twice a week on Sunday, sometimes you go twice a week and Wednesdays. If you're going to dedicate, what is that, 156 sermons, listening, kind of, and not really learning anything. If at the end of a year you haven't learned anything in the church you're going to, find a different church. It, it, there's no point. If what you're getting is superficial, somebody's not guarding their steps. And if you're going with the intent to listen and to learn and to hear something, but you're not because what's coming out of the pulpit is just a superficial glazing of a book, and not even in depth at that, then somebody's not been listening and it's not necessarily the people in the pews. I digress, let's move on. So he says, a dream in verse three, a dream comes when there are many cares. 
and many words mark the speech of a fool. Again, don't offer the sacrifice of fools. What's the sacrifice of fools? Many words mark the speech of a fool. How do you know a fool? They're talking all the time. They've always got something to say and an opinion on everything. Now, we all have opinions. The difference is, you know, Solomon said there's a time for everything. There's a time to speak up and there's a time to be silent. And if all you know how to do is speak up and not shut up, you're a fool. That's what Solomon was teaching us. Learn when to be silent, to listen and to learn, to hear. Do you ever notice when Jesus was teaching in a crowd and they'd ask him a question and he would answer it and they would go like, well, we don't really understand. His answer, the way he would answer that, he would respond to it saying, for, the, for them that have ears to hear, let them hear. Meaning, eh, not everybody's going to get it. Because half of them aren't even paying attention. They're half in, half out. Half present, half not. They're not there to learn or to listen. They're there to see a miracle. To see something cool. To entertain themselves for a few hours another day. Right? This is why we see in all through Solomon, this Ecclesiastes, all through that Solomon is talking about this like cycle that everyone goes through. And remember last week, we, he talked about the dead that are already dead, which implies that there are the dead that are still alive, right? Kind of like playing fetch with your dog. You throw the ball, he brings it back. You throw it again, he brings it back. You throw it again, like, what is the point of this? It's accomplishing nothing. And that's what Solomon's like, that's your life. <laughs> you throw the ball, bring it back, throw the ball, bring it back. If you aren't focused on the correct things, you don't have your priorities in order. So a dream, a dream, this a vision of, you know, the what the future could hold, hope, potential. A dream come it comes when there are many cares. <laughs> the interesting thing about this, the NIV renders it this way: a dream comes when there are many cares. You'll see this other translations will basically the idea behind the Hebrew here is that many cares, meaning like a, a worried, busy mind. You've got a lot of stuff going on and you're stressed out over it or you're trying to accomplish everything in one day. A dream comes when you're trying to do that. It's not a dream so much as it's referring to this idea of a nightmare. So constantly being busy and constantly trying to get everything done in one day and not taking a breath and slowing down and living in the moment, but trying to live for tomorrow, because that's why you're trying to do everything today. That's the stuff nightmares are made of. That's what Solomon is saying here. So slow down, mothers, slow down, take a breath. You can sit down too and just relax. Take a moment. Solomon said many times, he'll say it again before we get to the end of this chapter. This is what I know. To eat, to drink, to enjoy your work. That's a gift from God. Everything else you're adding to it, that's all you. God didn't do that to you. <laughs> like, that's just all your stress that you're self-inflicting. Take a breath. And he says in verse 4, when you make a vow to God. So we talked about going into the house of God and guarding our steps. And now he's saying, when you make a vow to God. Do not delay to fulfill it. Don't wait to pay up. If you made a promise, you best keep that promise. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. Like, now. Get it? That's you have to get done. God didn't put that on you. You put that on you by making a promise to God. Now, if you're going to make a promise to God, you better keep that promise. It's not like breaking a promise to a friend. It's not like breaking a promise to an employer or they might get angry. But the God who created everything and can destroy everything and change hearts and minds and situations, you don't want to not pay up when you make a promise, when you make a vow. As a society, culturally, we've lost this. And I think this is one of the most untalked about sins of the church is broken vows, broken promises. 
we don't look at the sin of broken promises like it's an issue, right? It's just like, oh, well, they said they could do it, but I guess they couldn't. They just got something else. Plans changed. God doesn't see it that way. And that's what Solomon is saying. He said in verse 6, do not let your mouth lead you into sin. Don't, don't let your mouth be the thing that gets you into trouble. Which is what gets most people into trouble most of the time, including myself, is not knowing when to shut up. But I know when to speak up. I just think every time is the time to speak up. I guess that makes me a fool. <laughs> Fair enough. I'll stand behind that. It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. Like, don't even make a promise unless it's a promise you intend to keep. Husbands, wives, or I should say, fiancés, boyfriends and girlfriends. This is something that we take too lightly when it comes to vows. Now, we know how angry we get if, you know, a person in a relationship that we're in a relationship with breaks a promise or breaks a vow. But remember that God refers to this relationship he has with us as a marriage. So these are marriage vows. So when he's saying, like, for example, one of the Ten Commandments that everyone always gets wrong is not to do not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. It has nothing to do, and I've said this before, but I'm going to repeat it here. It has nothing to do with saying, like, oh, my God. That's not what it is. He's saying this relationship he has with us is a marriage. So when we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, I put my faith in Jesus, yes, I'm a Christian. Okay, yeah, that's a marriage between you and God. And when I got married, my wife took my last name. Now, if she continued to live like she was single, that's a problem. She took my name in vain. It was vain, meaningless, useless. Vanity of vanities, it meant nothing. Thankfully, I have an awesome wife, and she didn't do that. So, we do that to God, though. We'll take his name and then change nothing. Live like we are still single. He, this is the, what God is saying when he says, like, it was so important that he had to put it in the list of commandments in the beginning. Don't take my name in vain. And Solomon's saying, don't let your mouth lead you into sin, right? Don't promise something you're not going to be able to fulfill, something you're not going to be able to achieve. Don't make empty promises. Don't overpromise, right? Don't do that. And then under deliver, and then you risk angering an almighty God, like the almighty God of the universe. And the only way we do that is if we lose perspective on who he is. It says in verse 6, he continues on saying, And do not protest to the temple messenger, the guy who comes to collect your payment you promised. Because you promised, you know, the bishop, hey, yeah, I'll kick in you know, $1,000 to help with whatever. So when he comes to you and like, hey, you know, it's been a few weeks, or you said you were going to pay, are you going to pay? Temple messenger. Interestingly enough, too, the Hebrew does make no distinction whatsoever between this word messenger and angel. So you'll see the angel of God, angel of the Lord, messenger, literally means the same thing. So the guy who shows up representing God's affairs to have you pay up on a promise you made, he says, and do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Well, I didn't mean it. I wish I could, but things changed. Why should God be angry at what you say and destroy the work of your hands? Oh, this is interesting. So we've talked for chapters about the work of your hands, this toil every day, the labor that you produce. There's a lot of energy that goes into building that, right? And this was Solomon was saying, I have built the vineyards, I've built orchards, I've done it, I've, I've built everything, with, things with my hands, I've built a kingdom. Why should what you say which is so easy to control, it costs you nothing to shut up. Why should it be what you say that causes God to destroy the work of your hands? Keep perspective and don't make a promise you're not willing to keep. If you're going into a marriage 
you know, you're engaged to be married and either of you enter into that marriage and take the vows lightly, you can't say two, three years later, like it was simply just a mistake. Yeah, well, don't rush into things, one. And two, don't take it lightly. Actually, think about the vows you're saying. Especially if you're just going to use the, the cookie cutter vows everyone uses, like in sickness and in health and richer or poorer. But, and everyone's like, yeah, that sounds great. Until it happens and you're like, what do you mean you're broke? Like you had money and now you, now you don't. What happened? Like, oh, we can't live like this. And it becomes, causes a big problem. That somebody didn't take the vow seriously for richer or poorer. In sickness and in health, it's not always going to be top of the mountain kind of high. Sometimes you're going to go through challenging seasons. And those challenging seasons are where you're paying up the vow. Where you're holding up your end of the bargain. Because remember, it's a three-strand rope. It has nothing to do with just two people. If it was two people, they could be like, yeah, we changed our minds. But it is a three-braided rope. And that three, that third main strand we talked about last week is God. A marriage is between three people. You, your spouse, and God. So take your vows seriously. It helps occasionally to read over those. Like, what was it that we said? <laughs> hmm. If you're writing your own vows... Ooh, don't be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God that you will not be willing to uphold or keep. That's what Solomon is saying here. Is carefully consider the vows and promises you make. And then he says in verse 7, Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. Therefore fear God. You know, much dreaming and many words. Those are meaningless. We've talked about a lot of things that are meaningless up so far, right? This is the most used and abused word in Ecclesiastes. Uh, the entire book. And now he's saying here, <laughs> we've talked about like everything is vanity, everything is vain, everything is pointless, meaningless. He's drilling this point home in this chapter. Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. You can have all the dreams and things that you want to accomplish and every the visions and everything you foresee for yourself for your future. He said, all those dreams and all the words, pointless, meaningless. Why? Well, they're focused on tomorrow. They're focused on in the future. And it's not a problem to focus on the, the future, right? Because you've got to be wise. You can't just live... Like, tomorrow's never going to come, right? Rack up $20,000 in credit card debt today and act like you're not going to have to pay it back tomorrow. You're going to have to pay that back. You're going to have consequences. I'm not talking about disregarding those. But what Solomon is saying here is that, yeah, all the dreams and all the words are meaningless if you don't fear God. That's why he's saying, therefore, fear God. Because there is an interesting part of, uh, oh, uh, let me find the verse. Found it. Okay. Like I was saying, there's nothing wrong with looking towards the future, right? Because God's not just, you know, God of the future. But we have to also remember today. Because God's also a God of the moment. And he's a God in this moment, too. So, in Jeremiah chapter 23, and it's one of my favorite chapters in Jeremiah. Because he just admonishes false preachers and people who just preach when he didn't tell him to preach. So in verse 23, chapter 23, he says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? So two things he's pointing to here. This idea that if it was if he was an idol, some kind of statue, thing that he was made into, then that would be a God at hand. But is he not? He's saying, I am a God at hand, right? I am right here with you. He literally says in Isaiah that I will uphold you by my right hand. Like literally as if you were teaching a toddler to walk and hold them by the hand. But he says, am I also not a God afar off, right? God is in heaven. You are on the earth. Now God is everywhere. But you can't be everywhere and you're not in heaven yet. So Keep that perspective and that reference for God and be present in the moment. Don't just 
idly half in, half out, half on your phone, half wandering through life, walking into walls. That's not living life. Those are the dead that are not yet dead. That's what Solomon was talking about last chapter. Now, interestingly enough, in this chapter 23 of Isaiah, as a side note, what brought all that part on is the verse before that, where uh, we'll go back to verse 20. He said, The anger of the Lord shall not return till he has executed, until he has performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. Again, it's preachers aren't listening. They're not trying to learn. They're just going through the motions and download a sermon off of whatever website, sermoncentral.com. That, uh, yeah, I've seen them. Somebody else writes a sermon, and it's, it's amazing how you see like 30 different preachers preaching the same thing every week. If that's your idea of what it means to be a pastor, get out of it. You, 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 that's not what it is. And that's why God said, like, I haven't spoken yet. They prophesied. Am I not? Am I not only a God at hand, but a God afar off? Like, do you remember who I am? And that's why in verse 7 of Ecclesiastes chapter 5 here, Solomon says, therefore, fear God. Have that respect for who he is. If you see the poor oppressed in a district, injustice and rights denied, hmm, sounding familiar yet? It's not a new problem. Don't be surprised at such things, for one official is eyed by a higher one, and over them both are others higher still. Basically, People treating other people like garbage is a trickle-down effect. It, it happens all the way down. It's not just isolated to the poor. Yes, the rich oppress the poor, but then the other people that oppress the rich, too. And Solomon will get into that, too, because remember, he was a king. He was a rich guy, too. But he also knows what, what it means to also be poor. So, in verse 9, he says, the, the increase from the land is taken by all. The king himself profits from the fields. The irony here, and this is what Solomon's going, yeah, you could be a good king or a bad king. It doesn't matter. You're a king, and yet you still, and when he says profits from the fields, literally you get your food, your sustenance from the dirt, just the same as anyone else. Whoever loves money never has enough. I like another translation, maybe actually King James, that it says, he who loves silver is never satisfied with silver. He who loves abundance is never satisfied with increase. And that is so valid. If it's money that you love, now this is another misquoted verse that you typically hear, right? Is oh, money's the root of all evil. No, no, it's not. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Remember, evil means harm. So... And when Solomon said, guard your steps in that first verse, he said, don't give, you know, go to listen, not give the sacrifice of fools. He said that they don't know that they do wrong. It's the NIV's translation of it. But you can look at like New King James Version. I think it says they do not know that they do evil. Offering these sacrifice the sacrifice of fools, going in with your mask and refusing to be vulnerable and open and transparent before an almighty and holy God. It's not just that you're doing wrong, right? That's It's that you're doing evil. You're doing harm to other people. And what here when he's saying that if you love money and it's never enough, you, whoever loves wealth is never, never satisfied with their income, this too is meaningless. What you invest your love into, because you, love is something we get so backwards and we don't understand what it means. We use words so often that we cheapen them and they lose their meaning. To say love, like I love my wife, or I love, you know, when we're dating, oh, I love you. 
you may like that person, but love is something that, yeah, and we say like, oh, I need to hear you say it. When God talks about love, love requires sacrifice. It must cost you something. And if you're going to say, I love you, that means I'm willing to sacrifice for you, whether that is my time, my energy, my resources, my wealth, my my life. Because that's what Jesus said, right? Greater love hath no man than this, and he lays down his life for a friend. Love costs something. When David went to buy the field to uh, the Fuller's field, uh, the guy he was going to buy it from actually told him, like, no, I'll give it to you, right? If you're going to use it to build a temple, I'll give it to you. He responded and said, I will pay for it, right? I will pay for it. I have to pay for it because I will not offer anything to my God that costs me nothing, right? If you love someone, you're willing to pay the price that whatever it is that it costs. Love requires sacrifice. Now, in verse 11, he's saying, as goods increase, so do those who consume them. So, yeah, the goods increase. Okay. In other words, like, yeah, your, your profitable field is increasing. Well, so does the, the person who owns the field. Now, the message version of this, I want to read because it's fire. Okay. So we're on verse 10 and 11. Found it. Verse 10 and 11. So the one who loves money is never satisfied with money, nor the one who loves wealth with big profits. It's more smoke. The more loot you get, the more looters show up. And what fun is that to be robbed in broad daylight? <laughs> Preach it. Yes, that is exactly, exactly it. <laughs> when he's saying like, yeah, you have all the increase, right? The land increase from land is taken by all. Even the king requires, you know, the land to produce its fruit. But as goods increase, so do those who consume them, right? The more money you get, the more people that come out of the woodwork trying to rob you of it. So you can't say, like, money's the answer. Because mo money, mo problems, right? <laughs> That's what Solomon's referring to. You can't just say, oh, if I had, you know, a million dollars, I would never have to do this or I'd be happy, I'd, I'd, everything would be fixed. Obviously, you've never had a million dollars, right? Because if you did, you would know as you increase more wealth, there's also more problems you're going to face and more people trying to take that wealth, more people coming against you. You tend to, with more money, have more enemies than you do friends. And he's saying here in verse 11, what benefit are they to the owners except to feast their eyes on them? What benefit are all these looters coming out for if all you can do is watch and take in what they want and rob you blind, right? To be robbed in broad daylight. This too is just meaningless. <laughs> so he's saying in verse 12, as sleep, or the sleep of the laborer is sweet whether they eat little or much, but as for the rich, their abundance permits them no sleep. Yes, 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 yes. Understand this. Solomon as king, wisest man and wealthiest man in Israel's time. He's looking with kind of this, I don't want to necessarily say envy, but longing for the laborer. The guy who just has to go work in the field because he can do a hard day's work. He gets to lay down and get a good night's sleep. On the other hand, the wealthy don't have that option. Or the ones who are in charge of the fields don't get that option. You don't get the option to just go home and go to sleep and not have to worry about what's going on. That people are, you know, protecting the fields, right? When you know this, if you've ever been like a front line staff level employee at a business and then kind of worked your way into a manager position, the dynamic changes drastically. There's a reason why, you know, we call it salaried. 
and you have a because you're always on the clock right we're going to pay you one flat fee and that way we don't have to pay you overtime you're always on the clock so if it's two o'clock in the morning and something happens you don't get a good night's sleep you're the one getting woken up to deal with the problems the laborer doesn't have to do that so in a lot of ways what solomon is saying is don't think money's going to fix your problems because in order to get the money here's what you have to deal with and you, you've basically just purchased yourself more problems. And a lot of people don't realize that what they ask for prayers for is the thing that they prayed for before. Like, hear me out. Like, pray for me because I, I you know, I want, I'm hoping to get this job. Uh, we really need the money. And then later on, you hear like, pray for me, the job's going to kill me because I have like high blood pressure, right? Like, this is stressing me out. You prayed for this, didn't you? <laughs> it's not always going to be roses and sunshine. Now, in verse 13, he says, I have seen a grievous evil under the sun. A grievous evil. Something that's like egregiously harmful under the sun. Wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners. And that would be very painful. Uh, to be a wealthy person and to hoard it all to myself. Not being able to, to have the generosity or the compassion for other people. And this is when we were talking about everything's meaningless unless you have someone to share it with, someone to leave it to, right? An impact that you can make. And if you can't do that, it's all smoke, it's all pointless. He's saying, I have seen a grievous evil. Somebody of wealth hoarding it all to their own harm. That's what I found most interesting out of that verse is he refers to wealth hoarded to the harm of its owner. Doing nothing with the money, just keeping it, is somehow harmful. Wait a minute. So it's almost like if I have wealth and I do nothing with it, it's toxic. You, If you don't do what God gave it to you to accomplish in the first place. And this is where, does God matter? Yes. This question he's been asking the, in a roundabout way is, does God even matter? Yes. Because if you don't believe, like, oh, God doesn't matter, there's nothing but what's under the sun that I see here today, then I'm just going to keep all my wealth at there's no point. But he says that's harmful to you because that's a lot of stress you're going to carry about making sure that you're protecting it, keeping it, watching it, making sure that nothing happens to it. That's harmful to you. But you could actually be a blessing to someone else. If God gave you that wealth, do with it what God gave it to you for in the first place. Otherwise, it's harmful to keep it. Now, I'm not saying, oh, you win the lottery, go blow it all. That's not what I'm saying. Be wise. But this is why you also see people who do go and play the lottery and win it, and then they lose it all within like a year. They didn't have the wisdom to maintain that wealth. That's why they didn't have it in the first place. This is the, the idea of getting a major windfall is catastrophic in most people's lives. And you think it's something you want. It's not something you want. That does not, it, that does not go well for anyone. Now, in verse 14, he says, or, so I've either seen, seen it as wealth hoarded to the harm of its owners, or wealth lost through some misfortune, so that when they have children, there is nothing left for them to inherit. Now, previously, if you remember, he said, like, I saw that this was a great harm, a great evil, right? As a man becomes wealthy and then leaves it all to his kids and then they don't know what it's like to work anymore and now he's saying but the counterpart is also harmful is to earn all this wealth lose it all in a bad business deal and have nothing to leave to your family because whether they, they may not inherit a cent but what they will inherit is the shame and the animosity towards what they thought they had opportunity cost, right? What they thought they should have gotten. You've you've given you've given a legacy. By all means, you've given them a legacy, but it's not one that you would want to leave behind. It's a great harm. 
this is why like philanthropy is so important when you see among like people who are really wealthy, right? They start foundations and scholarships and things like that. So they can, a lot of times it's so they can be seen of men, right? Seen by other people giving back to the community. But for a lot of them, it's to give back to the community because you can't take it with you. Solomon knew this better than most, right? The Egyptian pharaohs at the time thought you could take it with you. You can't take it with you. And it won't be until the New Testament where you start to see this idea that laying up treasures in heaven moving forward, right? You can't take it with you, but you can kind of send it ahead of time and build up treasures for when you get there. That's a New Testament idea. But in the Old Testament, Solomon's not talking about that. He's basically saying it's harmful to have all this wealth because it's pointless and it's meaningless, right? And he who loves silver is not happy with silver. He who loves wealth is an increase in abundance isn't happy when he gets it. It's not even the silver that we're after, if that's the case, right? If you are if you love silver, but you're not happy when you get silver, is that what you were chasing? Or is it all just toil to kind of run out your life on this earth, you know, on the hamster wheel, and, until you die, to give some form of meaning? Because if all we see is what's under the sun, then really the best thing we could do is rush through this life and waste it and get it over with because it's trouble it's struggle it's challenge it's oppression it's injustice it's not fair life's not fair where do you think these phrases come from right <laughs> the idea that we can just if if all we see is we die we end in the dirt and that's the end of it if that's the case solomon's saying then it's everything's meaningless it's pointless and so are these rocks that you're so obsessed with. Diamonds and metals and minerals. Like, I can't remember, and I'll have to look and find it. It's one of the minor prophets I was studying a couple years back, and it just blew my mind because it's literally, literally God's like talking about they fight over the dirt. They fight over rocks. And we do. Gold, diamonds, like minerals, like oil we fight over the stuff that comes out of the dirt that's got to blow like the angels minds like no wonder it says they look at us and just wonder like you're you're giving them a second chance god like they're over there like squabbling over rocks <laughs> like out of all the creation they're the special ones <laughs> so anyway verse 15 Everyone comes naked from their mother's womb, and as everyone comes, so they depart. They take nothing from their toil that they can carry in their hands. This, too, is a grievous evil. As everyone comes, so they depart. And what do they gain since they toil for the wind? If your salary is smoke and you're toiling for the wind, uh, we talked about this last week, it literally has this connotation, this idea of spitting into the wind. If that's what you do and you work all your life for it and you can't take it with you, what's the point? Verse 17 says, All their days they eat in darkness. If you don't believe in anything outside of what you see under the sun and there's no eternity to be concerned with, uh, then all your days are just eating in darkness because then there is no hope. There is no point. Right? That's what Solomon's established that many times up to this point. He's saying, all their days they eat in darkness with great frustration, affliction, and anger. Ooh, three very interesting traits to say that these people, these wealthy people, they get great frustration. Yep. Affliction, typically caused by the frustration, the stress. And anger. Why do you think they get angry? And you see this with people who get, you know, they work pursuing their dreams, uh, be a, a singer or whatever. And then when they finally achieve that dream, they become bitter and angry towards the entire world. Like they want nothing to do with fans. They, they're always on like TMZ, like fighting people. Where do you think the anger comes from? I would suggest, and I would propose, perhaps the anger comes from this broken expectation, this idea that when I make it, everything's going to be great. 
all the issues that I have within me right now won't be issues then because money fixes it. No. And then when they, they get there and they realize I've made it and I still feel the same, I haven't fixed anything in me and there's no real gratification out of what I'm doing. It's just money. And once you have money, you're like, it's just pointless. Is this what I strived my entire world and life and day and night for? It's eating in darkness. And you, frustration, affliction, and anger. Is that a way to live life? Verse 18. He says, this is what I have observed to be good. So if, if it's not money, if it's not everything else, what is their good, right? He says, this is what I have observed to be good. That it is appropriate for a person to eat and to drink. That's appropriate. You need to do that. And to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life that God has given them. For this is their lot. This is what I have observed to be good. I told you I was going to say it again. He's saying it again. To eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in the toilsome labor, whatever the work is that you commit to doing, in the very few days that God gives you while on this earth, to do it. Find satisfaction in that. This is your lot. Focus not so much on every tomorrow as much as you do on every today. Being present in the moment. Because God will still be there tomorrow, but God is also here today. Have a respect and a he healthy fear, right? That's what I meant when it says this fear of God. It was a respect for who he is and a healthy fear of not wanting to take it lightly. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, ah, it's not just he gave you wealth and possessions, he also gave you the ability to enjoy them. So it's not bad to enjoy these things that God gave you. That's what Solomon is saying. If God's given you, you know, a fruitful life and you were able to make money or whatever it is, then there's nothing wrong with enjoying that because obviously God gave it to you and he gave you the capacity to feel joy. So you shouldn't feel guilty if God gave you something. You should be able to enjoy that. He said, Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. So if we focus on what God has given us, we have the capacity for joy, use it, find joy in the things that God has given us. And in doing that, those people seldom focus on the few days that we have or counting every day to, you know, oh, I have so many days and, you know, I'm working for the next 30 years. I'll retire by this time. By that point, I should have this much saved. And if that's your whole focus is not even tomorrow, but 50 years, 20 years, 30 years later, you're not living in today enough. There's a time for that. Set those things up. Make sure that you're not being unwise. But at the same time, don't forget to be present today. Enjoy today. Because whatever God has given you, and he has given you the capacity to enjoy things and so whatever he has given you, find satisfaction in your labor and enjoy what God has given you. If you do that, you tend not to stress out so much on how few days you may or may not have here on this earth. And we're going to get ready to go into chapter 6, which gets a little interesting. But the rest of the book, as we wrap up uh, these 12 chapters or so, we're going to start to see why... All of this comes together. And I want you this week, focus on what identifying what God has given you, right? Because if it's a gift from God, it's okay to be happy and find joy and satisfaction in that. The suffering servant mentality, I don't know where that comes from in today's modern you know, Christianity, that somehow you have to 
be suffering and poor. Okay, the Good Samaritan wasn't poor. Right? It's not about money. It's about the love of money. Nothing wrong with having things or money and finding joy in those things. Because if you have them, God gave them to you. So Solomon is saying, then be happy. But focus on the things that God has given you, not what God has given someone else. Trying to find satisfaction in the things God gave someone else, that's coveting. That's envy, right? That, and people get this one confused too. The difference between jealousy and envy, right? Because like you hear people go like, "Oh, you're jealous." Uh huh. Yep. You start. Uh, you start hitting on my wife. I'm like, I'm gonna get jealous. Uh, it's not envy. Envy is wanting something that's not yours. Jealousy is wanting something that is. Something that is yours. When God says, I am a jealous God, that's what he's talking about. When we have that marriage with him, and he's saying, don't take my name lightly, right? Don't take it in vain. You're mine now. Don't go worshiping other gods. I am a jealous God. That's what he's saying. It's not envy, because you're already his. <laughs> yes. So focus on the things that God has given you. Identifying the things that God has given you and find satisfaction in those things. And to tie it back to my favorite part of this whole thing, this whole chapter was this first verse. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools don't know that they're doing wrong or they're doing evil, right? I, I like the way that uh, Eugene Peterson, he was a pastor and an author, and he put it this way. Sometimes I think that all religious sites should be posted with signs reading, Beware the God. The places and occasions that people gather to attend to God are dangerous. They're glorious spaces and occasions, true, but they're also dangerous. Danger signs should be conspicuously placed, as they are at nuclear power stations. Religion is the death of some people. Amen. Religion is the death of some people. What's killing Christianity is Christians, churches. The churches have become a stumbling block to the cross because of all of the standards, the expectations, the garbage that they put on men's shoulders. Jesus referred to this as the burden that the Pharisees bind up to put on men's shoulders, but they themselves won't lift a finger to move it. It hasn't changed. It just had a new face. And we put on a mask to pretend we're a part of it, and we call that church. And God says, take off the mask. Take off the sandals where you're standing's holy ground. Guard your steps. Have a healthy fear and a reverence and respect for who he is this week. And I will see you next week. Love you guys.